Hello and welcome to our show. If you're watching this tape, it's a safe bet that you're interested in Armstrong laminate flooring. Maybe you've already bought your new laminate flooring. If you have, terrific choice. Armstrong laminate flooring is a great product from a name you know you can trust. But before we get more familiar with laminate flooring and how to install it, we'd better orient you to this tape. We've tried to make it easy for you to find your way through this tape by breaking it into segments. Each segment has a numbered, color-coded, geometric shape so you can find it easily. And there's a visible time reference in the corner to guide you. You can scan through to check out just those installation steps you're interested in or review those that may have left you a little uncertain. If you're using Armstrong laminate flooring with the unique new locking system, you won't need glue for most installations. You'll want to review the first nine segments and then skip ahead to segment 11. In any event, it's all here. Everything you need to know to install your new laminate floor. And won't it be nice to be able to say you did it yourself? You really did make a great choice in Armstrong laminate flooring. The rich, authentic wood visuals add a warm, wonderful feeling to just about any room. But it doesn't just look good. This floor performs. That's because of the unique way it's constructed. First, on top is the tough wear layer, which protects the pattern. It won't stain or fade from exposure to sunlight, and it won't wear through. Second, under the wear layer, is the image layer. Wood grain pattern so authentic, it looks like it's fresh from the forest, but it was recreated by a high-quality printing process. Third, under the pattern is a high-density fiberboard core that provides dimensional stability and helps resist gouging and indentation. And fourth is the backing, a balancing layer that resists moisture and keeps the Armstrong laminate flooring flat. Armstrong laminate flooring will stand up to the everyday disasters your family dishes out and keep its rich wood grain appearance for years and years. Armstrong laminate flooring is installed with what's called a floating floor system. It is never attached to the subfloor in any way. The reason it floats is to allow it to expand and contract with seasonal changes in temperature and humidity. It's perfectly natural, but to allow it to expand, you're going to leave a one-quarter inch gap around the entire perimeter of the room. You'll make that gap disappear with coordinated molding pieces for a beautiful finish. This floating, good-looking, durable floor is surprisingly easy to install. And you can do it with basic woodworking tools. Let's take a look. You'll want to have everything you need before you begin installing your new floor. By all means, bring home the Armstrong DIY laminate floor installation kit. This kit contains some special tools and accessories you'll find very useful in installing your floor. There's a tapping block, a heavy-duty pull bar, and 50 interlocking spacers. The kit also includes an instruction manual which takes you through the installation process step by step and it lists all measurements in the metric system as well as inches and square feet. We recommend you use the instruction manual in conjunction with this videotape. Besides the installation kit, you'll need some common hand tools, a tape measure, hammer, saw, a square, utility knife, a pencil, an Armstrong laminate flooring touch-up kit, polyethylene tape, 100% silicone caulk for bathroom installation, and a pry bar if you have quarter round or other moldings that have to be removed. You should also have safety glasses, a NIOSH designed dust mask, and a maintenance product such as Armstrong laminate floor cleaner. If you're gluing your floor together, you'll need a plastic scraper, a bucket of warm water, and clean cotton rags. There are some optional tools that professionals typically use, and you may choose to use them if they're available to you. They include a router and a custom bit, table saw, miter saw, circular saw, drill, 
jigsaw, a jam saw, Armstrong laminate flooring splines, dividers, and a chalk line. We strongly recommend you rent a laminate installation kit, which includes an Armstrong clamping system for use with the gluing system. It includes clamps, clamp handles, clamp extenders, and straps. This system can speed up the installation process and will ensure the best, tightest flooring joints possible, but it's not necessary or required under the warranty. See a sales associate for information about renting, borrowing, or purchasing a clamping system when you buy your flooring. If you're using the gluing system, you'll need Armstrong laminate floor glue. There are lots of other kinds of glue on the market, but Armstrong laminate floor glue is specifically designed to make the installation easy and provide a strong, durable, water-resistant bond between the pieces of flooring. A pre-drilled hole in the tip ensures just the right amount of glue. We recommend applying a 3 seconds inch bead. Here's what a 3 seconds inch bead looks like with a 3 seconds inch drill bit for reference. If the glue bottle gets clogged at any point during your installation, we recommend you puncture the clogged tip with a 3 seconds inch bit rather than clip the top of the bottle. Armstrong laminate floor glue is also unique in that dried glue is peelable, so cleanup is very easy. You'll also need foam underlayment to put under your new laminate floor. Armstrong's two-in-one foam underlayment provides a cushion, helps absorb sound, provides a thermal barrier, and compensates for slight subfloor imperfections. It also provides its own moisture barrier when you're installing over concrete subfloors. You'll probably need moldings to dress up your installation. Armstrong provides a line of coordinated transition pieces which have been styled to coordinate with each of the flooring designs. There's quarter round molding for the perimeter of the room at the walls, end moldings for use around tubs, sliding glass doors or toe kicks, T moldings for use in doorways or entryways or when your room is longer than 40 feet or wider than 26 feet, stair nose moldings for stairways, and reducer strips to make the transition from your Armstrong laminate flooring to another type of flooring. So you want to make sure you have all the right transition pieces to finish your floor beautifully. We'll talk about how to install these later in the video. And that's all you'll need, except for the laminate flooring itself. Before you buy it, you'll have to estimate how much you'll need for your room. We'll cover how in the next segment. To determine how much Armstrong laminate flooring material to buy, begin by taking the measurements of the room in which you plan to install it and converting those measurements into square feet. Take that number and divide it by the square footage contained in a single box of Armstrong laminate flooring. That's usually 21, but check your carton. Once you have that number, round up to the nearest whole number and then add one more box for every 200 square feet of flooring. Rolls of foam cover 100 square feet. Bottles of glue also cover 100 square feet in a standard installation. There is very little waste in a laminate flooring installation, but you will need a little extra flooring material. That extra carton per 200 square feet should cover it. When you bring your new flooring home, it's necessary to place it flat on the floor in the center of the room in which you're going to install it for 48 hours before installation. The room temperature should be 65 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity should be 65% or less. This is important for the overall stability of the floor installation and it's necessary for any wood-based flooring product. During this time, you can start preparing the room and organized. One of the nice things about Armstrong laminate flooring is that you can install it over virtually any existing floor, wood and wood underlayment, concrete, ceramic and resilient tile, vinyl sheet flooring, even carpet if it's fully adhered to a wood subfloor and no more than a quarter inch thick. That means you don't have to pull up old floors and deal with the mess or the hassle of repairing most subfloor damage.
Just make sure the old subfloor meets building codes and is structurally sound, dry, clean, and flat. Fill in any major gaps, holes, or cracks in wood or concrete floors with the appropriate patch. Concrete must be fully cured and must not show signs of moisture or alkali. We recommend you test for moisture in concrete before installation. Tape three foot by three foot pieces of polyethylene to the subfloor. After 24 hours, if moisture condensation appears on the film or the concrete appears dark colored, it's likely excessive moisture is present and you'll want to consult a professional to run a calcium chloride test to determine whether laminate is the right choice for this environment. Check out the existing baseboard molding. If there's quarter round, you'll want to remove it and you'll probably want to replace it with the Armstrong molding that matches your new floor. If the existing baseboard molding will accommodate the addition of the Armstrong quarter round to cover the quarter inch gap that you'll create when you install the laminate flooring, you can leave the baseboard in place. You will have to undercut door trims to make sure that the laminate floor floats freely under these trim pieces. Use a piece of foam underlayment and laminate flooring to guide the height of the cut. You may also find that you'll have to plane or cut the bottom of doors because of the increased floor height. Okay, after you've cleaned up any dirt and debris and let the flooring materials acclimate for 48 hours, you're ready to begin the installation. The next step is to begin the layout of the floor. To decide where to begin, consider incoming light. It is usually best to install Armstrong laminate flooring with the planks running parallel to light coming in windows or glass doors. For any installation, the starting wall should be long and as straight as possible. So find the longest, straightest wall parallel to the incoming light, and that's where you'll begin. <laughs> We recommend a good quality carbide tipped cutting blade, the type designed for cutting composition and laminate materials such as melamine or coreboard. When using a handheld power saw, keep the decorative side facing down to minimize chipping. Cut the material in an area away from the installation site to control sawdust. You can use a hand saw, but cut with the decorative side of the board facing up to minimize chipping. Use a square to keep your cut line straight. If you have any irregularly shaped obstacles in your room, like stone fireplaces, for example, you may have to make a paper pattern of the shape of the object, then transfer the pattern to the flooring material and cut it to fit. Pipes passing through the floor are no problem either. If the pipe is near the end of a board, measure, locate, and cut a hole one half inch larger than the pipe. Cut across the board through the center of the hole. Glue the pieces in place. Tighten the joints and use spacers at the perimeter of the room to keep the board snug during installation. If the pipe passes through near the edge of a board, measure, locate, and cut a hole one half inch larger than the pipe. Cut at a 45 degree angle from the edge of the board to the hole. And glue the pieces in place Tighten the joints and use spacers at the perimeter of the room to keep the board snug during installation. Before you install your new floor, consider the placement and type of the various moldings and transition pieces you will be using to finish the job.
Using quarter round doesn't require any pre-planning, but in areas like against a tub or under toe kicks where you will install end molding, you'll need to expand the gap from a quarter inch to one half of an inch. This is because the foot of the end molding is a quarter inch thick, and it will fill a quarter inch gap, leaving no room for expansion. Simply use two one quarter inch spacers at these locations to allow for this molding. In places where your laminate floor will transition to another kind of flooring, you'll need a reducer strip. Take a piece of wood about one and a half inch by one half inch, cut it to length, and temporarily fasten it in place. As you install Armstrong laminate flooring, place spacers against this piece of wood, creating a one quarter inch gap as you did at the walls. In rooms that are longer than 40 feet or wider than 26 feet, or when the laminate flooring continues through a doorway to another room, you'll need a T-molding. Take a piece of wood about one inch by one half inch, cut it to length, place it directly against one side of the flooring and fasten it in place. On the other side, use a spacer to create a quarter inch gap between the strip and the flooring. Depending on the installation system you're using, lock or glue the pieces in place, tighten the joints, and use spacers to keep them snug. You'll want to avoid narrow pieces at the finish wall. Check it out by measuring the distance between the start and finish walls. Divide the distance by the width of your flooring. That's normally seven and a half inches, but check your carton for dimensions. If the remainder is less than two and a half inches, cut off two and a half inches from the width of each board in the starting row. Roll out a strip of underlayment foam along the starting wall and cut it to length. We're using Armstrong two-in-one underlayment. You'll roll out additional pieces of foam as the installation progresses, being careful not to overlap the edges of the foam. Over concrete, seal against migrating moisture by taping the seams of the two-in-one foam underlayment with two-inch wide polyethylene tape. In a gluing system installation, you'll begin by dry fitting, assembling the first three rows of full boards without glue. Armstrong laminate flooring is packaged very carefully, but you should inspect each piece for damage prior to installation. And we recommend you mix boards from three open boxes of flooring at a time. Begin in the left-hand corner and place the boards with the grooves against the starting wall. This is where you begin to create that one quarter inch gap we spoke of earlier. We've made this easy for you by providing spacers which are exactly a quarter inch wide at their base. Place one spacer at the start of each row and three spacers along the length of each plank as you lay them down. Continue laying pieces in the first row until you come to the end you'll almost certainly have to cut this last piece. Measure the space. If the distance is less than 12 inches, go back to the first plank in the row and cut off 12 inches. Reposition the pieces in the row and then remeasure. Subtract a quarter of an inch for the gap on that side and mark the board with a pencil and a square. Cut off the last piece in the first row Put it in place and insert a quarter inch spacer to keep the whole row snug. Don't worry if the gap is a little more than a quarter of an inch. You can use two spacers together, lying on their sides as a wedge to keep the whole row together. Wall irregularities greater than a half inch require cutting the first row of boards to fit the contour of the wall. Use a dividers set to one inch or a spacer to mark the contour on the board. Cut the boards, position them, pull the last piece in place and use a spacer or two to keep it snug. 
You may be able to start the next row with the remaining piece from the first row. But if a plank is less than 12 inches, it's best to cut a new board in half and continue on. See why we told you to get a few extra pieces? Remember, we're not using glue at this point, so continue to dry fit the pieces in the second and third rows. Dry fitting is critical to a quality installation. It gives you a chance to visualize and adjust the layout before applying glue. If you have to, adjust the layout so the joints are staggered pleasingly and so the cut end pieces are not too small. 